Um, and we would absolutely agree that, that prison is um, an opportunity for change and care and support. Um, and there is no better man to talk to us about that potential um, than, than Rod, Rod Mullen um, from Amity in the States. Um, I'm really, I never tire of listening to Rod talk about how we can deliver therapeutic communities within, um, within prison. He has a lifetime of experience and expertise that is such a valuable resource, regardless of whether we're thinking of running um, or trying to convince um, uh, prison services to, uh, to uh, deliver therapeutic communities within prison, whether we're working in um, therapeutic communities, Rod um, will have um, much to teach us and share with us. So um, can I ask you all to welcome Rod Mullen. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to say thanks first to to Coolmine for, wow, what a great conference this has been and what a wonderful welcome. And to EFTC, as we are kind of the outliers, the Americans uh, invading your continent. Uh, people have been very kind uh, during the last couple days, not to mention our president. Before we came, Nyap got a couple of t-shirts that we left in our, we left at, at home accidentally, which we were going to, they have, we apologize for our president in five languages. <laughs> uh, you know, this is kind of difficult. We have a, 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 somebody leading our country. I've, over the years, I've had times in my life when I've been very, very proud of our country for what it stood for. I've been times when I've been appalled, and recently I've been horrified. Uh, I think in a lot of ways uh, he reflects the worst aspects of our society. He's uh, greedy, short-sighted, uh, selfish, and bigoted. And there's a lot of other adjectives, but so I hope that when we meet again in Greece, uh, that there will, we will be in a better place in our country and that the, the better angels of our nature will have uh, moved us back uh, to where we should be uh, as a, a beacon of hope, of democracy, and of, of social justice. Uh, I also... Uh, <clears throat> want to dedicate this, if you'll do, oh, I have to do this, right. I'm used to saying next slide. I want to dedicate this presentation to a very, very wonderful man, a very close friend of mine, Harry Wexler, who uh, passed last November. Uh, uh, Harry uh, was a protege of George de Leon, and uh, what he took on was proving, as George has been so important in terms of laying the foundation for the credibility of therapeutic communities uh, to a much wider audience, Harry was really critically important in demonstrating the efficacy and the humanity of therapeutic communities in correctional settings. The first conversation I had with Harry on the phone, uh, I was called him and some other people we were looking for some statements about how important it was to have recovering people working uh, in therapeutic communities, uh, an ongoing battle. And Harry said, I'm a non-researcher researcher. And I said, what, what are you talking about, Harry? That doesn't make any sense at all. And he said, well, a lot of researchers are kind of in the ivory tower and, you know, publish or perish, and he said, I want to do things that really make a difference in people's lives. And, uh, and, and that's why I really focused on therapeutic communities. And I said, well, what, what's the thing that really resonated for you in terms of therapeutic communities? And he said, and I'll always remember this, 
So they give people dignity. And I think that's a very, we talked a little bit about that this morning in our roundtable discussion. The importance of giving people dignity and telling them that they can make a difference. That they can not only change their own lives, but they can be so important in changing other people's lives. And I think that is a message, no matter where we are in the world or what we're doing, that is so profound and so important to the work that we do. I miss Harry. I want to start this by, because uh, you know our talks are brief and, and uh, there's an awful lot of things we, we can't cover and can't say, so I want to give you some resources. This is something that's on our website, uh, Building and Replicating an In-Prison Therapeutic Community that Reduces Recidivism. This was our first prison project in 1990, the Donovan Project. And Harry did a, an outcome study on that under George's uh, supervision. And it really talks about what we think were the essential elements that made that such a very successful project, where we actually reduced recidivism by 45%, which was unheard of for a population of men who were high security and over 50% of them had, had crimes of violence as well as extensive drug abuse and it spent over half of their lives in, in prison. So worthwhile to look up if you're doing this work. The other thing is this paper which was in the uh, Therapeutic Communities Journal uh, written by Harry and Michael Prendergast kind of a survey of therapeutic communities in prison. Uh, this is, I think, available online. If not, we actually have it on our website to download in a PDF format. This is something that's available. We've done a lot of videos uh, at, at Amity to help our faculty learn more about therapeutic communities. This is one I did with Harry a few years back, where he does a pretty comprehensive review of therapeutic communities in prison, how they started, what is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and uh, I think you'll find it valuable. If you go to YouTube, if you go Amity Foundation USA, there's another Amity Foundation, but it's in China. Uh, so use USA. You'll see a list of videos. Well, this is one of those videos. And I think it's an excellent, uh, comprehensive, research-oriented presentation on the effectiveness of therapeutic communities in, in, in prison. And this is another one which uh, George did with us a, a year or so ago, which I think is very valuable in terms of how therapeutic communities uh, have uh, changed over the years, some of the opportunities and problems that we've had, and some of the challenges that we're facing today. So, okay. So, uh, TCs and corrections. So, you know, the, the, the history of this is uh, really this is sort of in our DNA. Uh, therapeutic communities in America started with Synanon in 1958. And by 1961, the first therapeutic community uh, in prison started in the Nevada State Penitentiary. And it was brought there not to deal with drugs, although, of course, there were drugs, it was really to do with violence. It was a very, very violent uh, prison. And uh, Synanon was brought in and uh, actually uh, was pretty successful. Uh, so uh, this is really something we've been doing for almost six decades now. So we have quite a robust uh, history uh, we've made lots of mistakes along the way, and we've had lots of successes, and it's important to kind of, what, what were the things that were very powerfully successful, and where are the areas where we kind of slipped off the, and went into the ditch? But you know, in many ways, most of, not many of the uh, prison TCs have been affected more by politics than by their outcomes. So, uh, Here's an example. This is a, from a recent paper. In the USA, prison-based therapeutic community treatment has become a dominant evidence-based paradigm. Uh, 
the, these facilities are present in over a quarter of prisons and serve an estimated 45,000 offenders. So my question is, uh, how many of these therapeutic communities are real? How many of them have really been implemented properly? And how many of them are riding, have said, I'm a TC because they want to ride on the outcomes of those TCs that really have done proper implementation. And they put a TC label on their shirt and do a really kind of lousy job and we all sort of end up uh, having to deal with people saying they don't work as a result of that. I will tell you from uh, my knowledge and my friend's knowledge in the United States, not very many of these things are properly implemented in therapeutic communities. They just aren't. And so proper implementation, if you want the results, you got to do the implementation according to the book. And we've kind of written the book at this point. So what are some of the external factors that cause failure? And again, if you look at the resource materials I'm giving you, they're much more detailed, but just kind of an overview. <clears throat> Well, one of the external factors is the failure to ignore what is now very well documented critical elements needed for a TC uh, to form and be successful. And over and over and over, I see RFPs coming out in the United States, and I look at them, and people say, why aren't you bidding on this? Is because I, as I said, I can read it, and I can tell this is going to be a failure. And I'm not interested in... Uh, employing people uh, for the sake of employment to do something that I know is extending false hope to the inmates and which essentially is eventually going to be, uh, uh, when they run the numbers, is going to be shown to be a failure. Uh, inadequate funding. Uh, sometimes uh, folks want, want a, uh, uh, they want a Cadillac on a Yugo budget and uh, you're going to have to you have to fund these things adequately, so that you can hire good people to go in. Prison work is tough, uh, uh, very very demanding. As as anyone who works in institutions, whether they're uh, coming in uh, in a TC or whether they're working as a correctional officer, it's a very very demanding job, emotionally demanding. You know, in the United States. Uh, uh, Correctional officers have one of the highest rates of, uh, uh, of, of depression, of heart attacks, and other kinds of diseases. It's a very, very stressful job. So you've got to give people a, a reasonable incentives uh, to, to go in. Uh, and a lack of ongoing training and evaluation. We think that we can start a program, train people once, and that's it. This is an ongoing process to keep the, the, these programs vital. Uh, and you need to evaluate them and see what you're doing. You've got to get some feedback because if you don't get that kind of feedback, uh, they, they can devolve. They, can, uh, they may start very well. So many programs I've seen in the United States that were model programs, and when I went to look at them, they were disasters because they didn't get ongoing train, there wasn't ongoing training, and there wasn't real evaluation going on. And then failure to provide for seamless transition to community-based treatment on release. What we have proven over and over and over again, the prison program itself is not sufficient. This is a case of necessary, but not sufficient. And we've done these outcome studies over and over and over again. Prison program is readiness for the community-based phase. I don't even call it aftercare. I say it's one treatment experience that occurs in two locations, okay? And that's a critical part of it. If you don't do that, uh, uh, it's, you're not gonna, it doesn't pencil out financially, and it doesn't work very well in terms of the goals of habilitation. And I use the word habilitation because rehabilitation implies that we're returning somebody to a state where they were functional. Most of the people that we see in prison were never functional. Uh, a, a, a lawyer who started smoking cocaine 
uh, and, and uh, lost his marriage, his house, and, 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 and his Maserati, uh, once he cleans up, still is a lawyer and has a college education. But most of the folks we see are really quite different. They've never had an adequate education. Uh, they may be grew up in families that were very, very dysfunctional, in neighborhoods that were very dysfunctional. Uh, and they don't need rehabilitation. Uh, we don't want to rehabilitate them to that state. We need to habilitate them. We need to get them to a place they've never been in their lives before. And that's why it takes a while. External failures, things causing failure, and this is not going to happen in Ireland. Wow, what a great group of people you have to run your prison services here. I've now met three, uh, including uh, uh, Mr. Murphy's staff out at, at Montjoy, and I'm wowed. I'm really impressed. I mean, this is a, this is a, a, a very, very uh, uh, humanistic, thoughtful uh, group of people who are determined to focus on the needs of these uh, inmates and do the very best they can to get them back into society. Uh, what, uh, I just am really kind of blown away by it, and you're very fortunate. Uh, so, but in many countries, including our own often, there is a really open hostility to therapeutic communities. I mean, people don't like them. They're, and so their outright attempts to subvert, compromise, and destroy the therapeutic community right from the beginning. Uh, and I've had this experience myself in startups that we did or ones that we helped uh, start up. And it's pretty ugly. Uh, you can overcome it, but it's not fun. Uh, the other way, which is more subtle, but e I think equally damaging, <laughs> is tarring effective therapeutic communities with data obtained from wannabe TCs, uh, which really never incorporated the essential elements necessary for success. So the successful ones essentially are blamed for the failures of those that really do a very good job. Uh, internal factors, and, and George has talked a lot about what are the things that have really compromised therapeutic communities from the outside, and then what are the things uh, that we've done to ourselves? One is acceptance of conditions that guarantee failure. And if you look at an RFP and you say, can I really do the essential elements of a therapeutic community here? Are the correctional uh, 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 officials, as they are in Ireland, wide open and ready to really work with you, sorry, uh, in a collaborative manner and say, this is a joint venture, we have to do this together, or are they uh, really uh, not interested in success and just doing a check mark in the box? Uh, if you walk into something where you know it's going to fail and take it, don't blame someone else. Uh, failure of the first circle to form community. We've talked a little bit about this in this conference, how important it is for the faculty, for the staff to come together and themselves form community. If they can't form community, how do we expect the residents or in prison the inmates to form community? Failure to hire appropriate faculty, including credible role models. You know, people who have been there, who have been incarcerated and have changed their lives, have an enormous power to convince uh, inmates in a prison, hey, I've been there. You know, I sat in the same chair. I went through the same process. I wore uh, prison blues or whatever it is here in Ireland. And I have changed my life. I'm married. I have a family. Wow. That just takes away all the excuses. And it's very important that we have people who are credible. Failure to address, of course, the, uh, the essential elements. They have to be sometimes modified somewhat in prisons, but if you don't get them in place, you're not going to have a functional therapeutic community. And faculty and staff that begin, we have different roles. The role of the correctional staff is always going to be security. It, is, it can be many other things. 
you know, as was explained this morning. They can be very humanistic. They can, uh, I remember the warden when we went into Donovan, and it was a very tough prison, and he was a very tough guy. And he said, you don't run an institution with guns, you run it with your mouth by communicating, okay? Uh, he was a, and he was a very, very effective warden. But there is a security element. It's very, very important. Every officer knows that the security of that institution is paramount. Our, and we, of course, when we go into these things, we have to also be very security-minded and, and make sure that we're not compromising institutional security. But we have a different role. And what I've found over the years is that many of our faculty, as they go into these things, start sliding into the correctional role and forgetting their role. Factors for success, and we have all these things going on out at Mount Joy, I'm pleased to say. Dedicated space, very, very important. Hiring faculty that are credible to the inmates. Cross-training, we talked about out at Mount Joy, they were asking me some of the things that are really important. I said, every quarter, spend a couple days, get your correctional staff that are immediately involved in this and your TC staff together, and spend a couple days working out issues, training each other and do that throughout the life of the project. Ability to screen for entry and remove for cause, so that you do that together with your, the TC and the corrections do that together. Uh, it's really bad when you have uh, a situation where the corrections people put people in that you, you have no, you can't even interview them. They're just put in or they're removed without you knowing why. Immersion. The TC experience is an immersion experience. We want people to do to, as much as possible the whole experience to be TC, not some f two or three hour experience, you know, a, a few times a week. Support by the warden or equivalent, inmate release upon completion, so you don't go back into general population, because if you do, you lose most of what you learned and linked TC aftercare with sufficient duration. Critical. Okay, quickly I'm gonna run through these just so you get kind of a sense. Historical context. The Senanon project, very successful, reduced violence, which is what they were supposed to do. New governor was appointed, prison was closed. Okay, not because it wasn't successful, because of politics, basically. 1974, some of you have read Martinson's Nothing Works uh, tome, which was Nothing Works in Correctional Rehabilitation Efforts. And then he went even further and said, the whole idea of rehabilitation doesn't work, it's bogus. What happened? What was our answer? Staying out, which showed that the TC was effective. That was Harry's first research project. 1980, the Rand Corporation published a study called Varieties of Criminal Experience. Anybody had a juvenile record and done five years of prison, hard time? Forget it, keep them locked up forever. They'll never change. What did we answer with? This. These are all men who, had, who fit that profile and look at the drop in recidivism if they completed both the in-prison and aftercare, okay? This is three years. When it went out further, you know, the, the, the drop was uh, about 40, 45%. This is actually pictured in the prison. You can see these guys are having a good time in, a, in an encounter group. <laughs> 2007, uh, California's project, which was based on the successful Donovan project, mushroomed up to 10,000 in prison beds. Uh, and the uh, inspector general called it a billion dollar mistake. Here were their own statistics at the time he made the report. Okay, didn't look like a billion dollar mistake to me, but it was all politics and TCs were branded as failures even though the report primarily talked about the failure of institutions to provide the conditions for successful treatment programs. Yet, 
who got blamed? The providers who were actually producing the results. This is a recent publication which is causing some anxiety. Uh, 2014 publication on some 2002 data. It was a randomized study and, and it says TC treatment no better than outpatient treatment. Okay? Well, okay, it was a very, very good study done by some very reputable researchers, but what's the problem? They didn't look at aftercare. Okay? We know that None of the prison programs work really in any sufficient way unless you have the aftercare component, okay? So this again is one of these things where it's not a bad study, but if, it's, again, it's very much like the California thing. The headline becomes the story rather than, okay, I mean, uh, the value of it is, George and I have talked, the value is you can conduct a randomized study. The sad part about it is let's do a study that actually improves the field rather than puts another black mark on the field, okay? So what you really see here is uh, we had three programs that occurred at the same time, Amity, Keycrest, and Kyle. And what you really saw was dramatic reductions in recidivism, measurable reductions in negative behavior in prisons, which is a management tool. Okay, so there's actually a prison management issue here. In our uh, one in Donovan, we reduced uh, negative behaviors dramatically, you know, by like 90% in terms of serious infractions of prison rules. They became not only good people, they became good prisoners. And, uh, and, and you started with officers wanting to work in that unit because there was much less stress because they were treated with respect. And so you got cost benefits for the taxpayers and public safety. And look at three different programs, three different areas of the country, three different populations, and you can almost lay these results on top of each other, okay? And you really see the dramatic reduction is when you have the TC plus aftercare, okay? And that's the opportunity you're gonna have here in your first prison TC in Ireland, which is fantastic, because it's gonna be a howling success, I know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so here, Synanon was the first TC in America, it was incorporated in 1958, so next year will be a 60th anniversary of that edition of the therapeutic community. And why, while it had a very spectacular demise, nonetheless on every continent there are therapeutic communities, very robust evaluations and research uh, showing the evidence uh, of success with therapeutic communities, and yet to some extent we really remain outliers. Why? And we talked about that this morning, and I'll leave you with this. The beauty, beauty and tragedy of the modern world is it eliminates situations that require people to demonstrate a commitment to the collective good. A society does not offer its members an opportunity to act selflessly isn't a society at all. It's just a political entity that lacking enemies will fall apart on its own. And what do we do in therapeutic communities? It's the essence of therapeutic communities. We require people to act in the best interest of the community, making sacrifices, thinking about others, recognizing how their behavior affects others, and that grows them up, it matures them, and it prepares them for living in a moral way in society. And that's our gift. It's our gift not only to these inmates in Ireland, our gift to prisoners around the world who have the wonderful opportunity to participate in therapeutic communities, the gift to addicts who are suffering 
uh, coming from horrible situations uh, and uh, hopeless, broken, to reclaim their lives, to have hope and dignity in their lives. But also we set an example of how this methodology can be used in our society much more broadly for immigrants, you know, for refugees, you know, for other folks, for aged people who are so terribly isolated in our society, uh, for young people who are increasingly alienated and depressed and don't feel like they have a place in the world. We have a wonderful tradition and we have a wonderful gift. And uh, it is my pleasure to work with all of you and with my colleagues to talk about this and to share this gift. Thank you. If we do it properly, um, according to what we've learned, then we can have a significant impact beyond the TC itself. So, opportunity, plenty of time um, before we have lunch for questions um, and discussion. So, can I take the first question for uh, Rod's point about toughness and humanity not being incompatible? I, I thought that was a point really well made. I think Ian Williams is a, is a tough but humane prison governor, and I think that's necessary for the conditions. I, I, Rod's point also about the, uh, <coughs> the concept of the prisoner being prepared to be a moral citizen. I thought it is, it, I, I, you know, we've been talking about this a bit this morning. I think it is controversial. So I think there is something of a difficult sell for a, the moral position. How can you sell uh, morality, uh, Rod, with, and, and make it uh, acceptable to some colleagues? Well, I, I, I think uh, <clears throat> one of the ways, uh, you know, we, we look at therapeutic communities in a lot of different ways. I mean, there's many ways of defining it. It's like the, which facet do we look at? Uh, you know, for, for our colleagues in corrections, it's like, does it reduce recidivism? Does it, does it enhance or, or compromise institutional security? And their measurement is like, do these people go out and reoffend and come back into prison? And if they do at a significant, at, at the same rate that people are, who don't get treatment, then why are we doing this? We're spending a lot of money and not getting results. So we kind of know what the measurement is there. There's another measurement, you know, uh, do they really, uh, do men and women go out and play uh, an important role in their families and prevent this intergenerational propagation of dysfunction, you know, uh, we know that uh, in many ways the, the, when somebody uh, is badly parented, they get involved in the criminal justice system, that that, that is self-perpetuating if there's not an intervention. That they will have children and that their children will become the next generation and the next generation of dysfunctional, criminal, uh, very expensive for society. Uh, uh, citizens. We also know when we make a proper intervention that much beyond recidivism reduction, we're starting to see benefits two and three generations out because they go back and they pull their kids out of gangs. They are the father or the mother that they need to be and that those children then have children that are on a very different path in their lives, a very different vector in society, where they're productive and good citizens, and and the you know so this we we have uh, we we aren't very good at what George has called very wisely collateral benefits of therapeutic community treatment. Uh, we're very good at capturing collateral damage. Okay but we're not very good at capturing the collateral benefits of all this. I very often speak about the therapeutic community as a school for moral development. 
a gentleman by the name of Lawrence Kohlberg years ago, and some of, many of you are probably familiar with his work, really talked, what are the conditions for moral development? And if you lay down his conditions for moral development and you lay them next to George's essential elements for a therapy community, it's a lock. All the conditions for moral development are effective in a good run therapeutic community. And what do we see coming out? We see people coming out, the concept of right living, the concept of, yes, my, I can't, I don't, I don't have the right to be selfish because I've learned that in the therapeutic community that my behavior affects other people, which people were completely unaware of, that I have to act in the common interest, not just my own selfish interest. And that affects their families and it affects how they function in community. And it's one of the unheralded but very important benefits of what we do. Uh, and, and I hope that as we progress as a field over the next decades, that we proudly announce this is a very, we, we get caught up in the mumbo jumbo and the statistics and the, you know, and that's all very important stuff, but we sometimes, we're so interested in counting the trees, we miss the forest. And the forest is this incredible uh, ongoing effect, uh, much beyond the treatment episode, that positively benefits the communities that we live in. If my team and I are going in and we're opening up like a, 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 in a virgin prison where there's never been anything, uh, those are the first seminars we give. I mean, you know, I'll give seminars on what are the conditions for moral development, what are the conditions, what is, what is the Lucifer effect, what does Zimbardo have to say, what are the Stanford prison experiments, what does Alice Miller have to say about early childhood, we have all of this stuff in the seminar format, and then you step back, and community is method takes over, and you can walk, and I remember walking down a cell block, and hearing somebody say, you're just a hedonistic opportunist. And I thought, well, that worked. <laughs> because, 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 you know, men and women are incarcerated not because they're stupid. You know, so a lot of times we'll have these conversations amongst ourselves, and if you, if you just teach it, they then take what is valuable for themselves, and then they start teaching it to each other. And it makes for a much more interesting therapeutic community. Excellent. When we started, uh, just one, one comment on this, when we started the Donovan Project, which was our first prison project, which was uh, the one that Harry researched and was quite successful and really formed the foundation for this incredible expansion in, in California, uh, when Nai and I would visit the prison and uh, we'd get all 200 guys together and I would say every time I visited, this isn't just about you. Yes, if you do this right, it's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit your family when you get out. It's going to help you get and keep a job. But look, guys, you have a responsibility. If we prove, despite all the skepticism that we can do it, that we can really make this work, you're going to open doors for thousands of men and women who you will who will, you will never know, but who will benefit by your demonstration. Ten years later, there were 10,000 beds. They resonated to that message, which was fundamentally a message, a very moral message. You have a responsibility to people in the community you will never know and who will never thank you, but who will benefit by your personal demonstration. Is there um, a criteria or a governing body that can decide what's a TC or is not a TC? Um, uh, I suppose there's self-regulation in TCs in America. Right? Uh, so to either disassociate or make sure that it is a proper TC? The, the answer to that is no, and that's unfortunate. I think that our colleagues in Australia Lynn Major, when Lynn, when I met, met Lynn and had her make her presentation in Prague a few years ago, I came up to her and I said, you know, 
pardon the language, you're a goddamn genius, Lynn. I mean, this has been needed for such a long time to codify what we do and to set up a, a body that would essentially screen people. And what she's got going in Australia is something we should all learn from because they, uh, looking at the materials, we went through her workshop yesterday, really it's like you want to be a TC these are the criteria you have to meet and we're going to monitor and see whether you're really doing community as method and and that's a very very powerful evolution for our field to keep this problem that we keep having which is being tarred with the bad results of other people who call themselves therapeutic communities who never had any intention or ability or or willingness to really do the hard work that it becomes, comes to, to do a really good job. Uh, so I, I think that's a failure in the United States. And it's one of the reasons why we're really uh, struggling in many ways uh, with this. But I really see, uh, uh, again, in, in, in Europe and, and, and in Australia, coping with that problem and doing it in a way that really uh, uh, enhances what we do uh, and gives us some control over who gets to wear that label, who gets to, you know, uh, you know it's, it's like a university in which uh, anybody who says, I have a degree, uh, is recognized for having one and they don't have to go through school. I mean, <laughs> that would never work. Okay. But somehow or another, we've allowed it in our field. And uh, it's a good question. And I'm, I'm really proud and pleased to see what, what Lynn has done with the Australasian Federation in, in, in really addressing that particular issue. Uh, what I agree with on uh, Rod's statement is, is the overall extent to which standards and credentialing, standards in particular, and certification in the, uh, in the North American TCs, the limits of that movement, of the standards movement. But we did develop uh, a, a, a full panoply of corrections-based standards for TCs that would certify the therapeutic community in the American prison system, as well as a fidelity assessment capability which had to do with uh, who now will visit a particular prison and essentially assess them in terms of whether they're meeting the standards. And uh, I think uh, Lynn will, will attest to the fact that that was the basis for, for her a developing the, the Australian standards. And I would like to hear from Lynn on this. Um, and so, and that incidentally, you know, you should understand the history. That's 1999, it was, and that was a federally funded project. So that's how far we got with the, the, with the federal prison system. They wanted to know that we had a credentialing capability and that the issues of mm -hmm. fidelity could somehow be monitored in that way. And they funded the whole project. It took us about 18 months uh, with about 20 experts in the field, uh, all in corrections, laying out what those standards are. And they were largely based on uh, an instrument that Jerry Melnick and myself had developed, which is the Survey of Essential Elements Questionnaire, which laid out the elements of the prison-based TC and what it should look like. Uh, but Rod is right that, uh, that 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 whole process, incidentally, the actual certification um, uh, effort in that was actually carried out by corrections. So corrections themselves would then identify the uh, fidelity experts who would then use the standards to go out to the prison and, and do all that. Uh, and that probably was an inhibiting factor. We thought it would be a, a legitimizing one, you know, give it to corrections and let them do it. But uh, that was probably a, one of the mistakes that we made in that. Not that they were wrong about that, but it, it, to further a whole standards effort, uh, you need to really sophisticate that over the years with developing the fidelity assessment teams. And I want to make one comment about both uh, all standards, particularly the well-developed ones which are in Australia. There are. There's a concept that should uh, essentially dictate that. It's not, when we talk about fidelity and standards, you're really talking about two components. You're talking about what should exist as an essential element which defines the program as a therapeutic community, certifies it, if you ultimately leads to a certification of that. 
That's one. Does the element, the essential element, exist in the program? Do they do morning meetings, as an example? Are, are the residents trained to deliver po positive and negative, affirmative and corrective statements to one another? Do they run particular kinds of groups? All those things identify essential elements that should be there. But that's, that's a, what I'd call a fixed component of fidelity. The one that was not adequately uh, advanced was the dynamic evaluation of fidelity, which is how well do they run that? So it's not only do we have a morning meeting, yes, it's, and you can, get a, you can get a high mark where they have morning meetings, they've got the, the residents essentially doing their, their, their job functions, they do their push-ups and pull-ups, but we did not have an, a built-in built -in process for evaluating how well, that what I call the dynamic aspect of fidelity. How well does the morning meeting run? So uh, that still needs to be advanced. When even in training fidelity assessment teams, you can't simply say we have an expert who goes there. Uh, I want to even know what the expert is doing in terms to essentially define that. And then the model for that, and then I'll stop, but the model for that is in classical psychotherapy when the most advanced versions of American psychotherapy were in their best days, they had the capability of, let's say, looking through one-way vision mirrors to look at how well therapists were in, uh, doing the work in there. So it, in terms of assessing the dimensions of a high-fidelity therapist and what, what were they doing in there that uh, essentially is advancing the therapeutic session. So when I now go to do my own training, I do that on my own. That's much of what I do in the prisons now. And as, as a matter of fact, it's a training technique. Take five staff with me, sit and watch how the morning meeting is going. And then, and then take six of the residents and then come back and debrief how well they ran that and why it worked and why it didn't work. So there's a potentially a high productive uh, strategy that can evolve from this, almost program by program, when you think about fidelity in terms of not only is the element there, but it's actually being uh, implemented at its, at its highest level. Excellent. There's a nice uh, we can, sorry. Okay, so there's a nice video of George when he came to Amity last time earlier this year, throwing all of us out of the room and having uh, an hour and a half with the <laughs> with the with the residents with the students, and uh, and essentially assessing. Okay, you you know you say you got it going on here. I want to I want to talk to the people. I want to talk to the to to the students and see wh how they feel about it. Right. So. No better way for us to end our session with a challenge, again from George, to make sure that we all can prove to ourselves that we're doing it properly.